international short stories volume three french stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by bruce peary international short stories volume three french stories compiled and translated by francis j reynolds abandoned by guy de maupassant i really think you must be mad my dear to go for a country walk in such weather as this you have had some very strange notions for the last two months you drag me to the seaside in spite of myself when you have never once had such a whim during all the forty-four years that we have been married you chose fecon which is a very dull town without consulting me in the matter and now you are seized with such a rage for walking you who hardly ever stir out on foot that you want to take a country walk on the hottest day of the year ask d'apreval to go with you as he is ready to gratify all your whims as for me i am going back to have a nap madame de cadour turned to her old friend and said will you come with me monsieur d'apreval he bowed with a smile and with all the gallantry of former years i will go wherever you go he replied very well then go and get a sunstroke monsieur de cadour said and he went back to the hotel des bains to lie down for an hour or two as soon as they were alone the old lady and her old companion set off and she said to him in a low voice squeezing his hand at last at last you are mad he said in a whisper i assure you that you are mad think of the risk you are running if that man she started oh henri do not say that man when you are speaking of him very well he said abruptly if our son guesses anything if he has any suspicions he will have you he will have us both in his power you have got on without seeing him for the last forty years what is the matter with you to-day they had been going up the long street that leads from the sea to the town and now they turned to the right to go to etretat the white road stretched in front of them under a blaze of brilliant sunshine so they went on slowly in the burning heat she had taken her old friend's arm and was looking straight in front of her with a fixed and haunted gaze and at last she said and so you have not seen him again either no never is it possible my dear friend do not let us begin that discussion again i have a wife and children and you have a husband so we both of us have much to fear from other people's opinion she did not reply she was thinking of her long past youth and of many sad things that had occurred how well she recalled all the details of their early friendship his smiles the way he used to linger in order to watch her until she was indoors what happy days they were the only really delicious days she had ever enjoyed and how quickly they were over and then her discovery of the penalty she paid what anguish of that journey to the south that long journey her sufferings her constant terror that secluded life in the small solitary house on the shores of the mediterranean at the bottom of a garden which she did not venture to leave how well she remembered those long days which she spent lying under an orange tree looking up at the round red fruit amid the green leaves how she used to long to go out as far as the sea whose fresh breezes came to her over the wall and whose small waves she could hear lapping on the beach she dreamed of its immense blue expanse sparkling under the sun with the white sails of the small vessels and a mountain on the horizon but she did not dare to go outside the gate suppose anybody had recognized her and those days of waiting those last days of misery and expectation the impending suffering and then that terrible night 
what misery she had endured and what a night it was how she had groaned and screamed she could still see the pale face of her lover who kissed her hand every moment and the clean-shaven face of the doctor and the nurse's white cap and what she felt when she heard the child's feeble cries that wail that first effort of a human's voice and the next day the next day the only day of her life on which she had seen and kissed her son for from that time she had never even caught a glimpse of him and what a long void existence hers had been since then with the thought of that child always always floating before her she had never seen her son that little creature that had been part of herself even once since then they had taken him from her carried him away and had hidden him all she knew was that he had been brought up by some peasants in normandy that he had become a peasant himself had married well and that his father whose name he did not know had settled a handsome sum of money on him how often during the last forty years had she wished to go and see him and to embrace him she could not imagine to herself that he had grown she always thought of that small human atom which she had held in her arms and pressed to her bosom for a day how often she had said to monsieur d'apreval i cannot bear it any longer i must go and see him but he had always stopped her and kept her from going she would be unable to restrain and to master herself their son would guess it and take advantage of her blackmail her she would be lost what is he like she said i do not know i have not seen him again either is it possible to have a son and not to know him to be afraid of him and to reject him as if he were a disgrace it is horrible they went along the dusty road overcome by the scorching sun and continually ascending that interminable hill one might take it for a punishment she continued i have never had another child and i could no longer resist the longing to see him which has possessed me for forty years you men cannot understand that you must remember that i shall not live much longer and suppose i should never see him never have seen him is it possible how could i wait so long i have thought about him every day since and what a terrible existence mine has been i have never awakened never do you understand without my first thoughts being of him of my child how is he oh how guilty i feel toward him ought one to fear what the world may say in a case like this i ought to have left everything to go after him to bring him up and to show my love for him i should certainly have been much happier but i did not dare i was a coward how i have suffered oh how those poor abandoned children must hate their mothers she stopped suddenly for she was choked by her sobs the whole valley was deserted and silent in the dazzling light and the overwhelming heat and only the grasshoppers uttered their shrill continuous chirp among the sparse yellow grass on both sides of the road sit down a little he said she allowed herself to be led to the side of the ditch and sank down with her face in her hands her white hair which hung in curls on both sides of her face had become tangled she wept overcome by profound grief while he stood facing her uneasy and not knowing what to say and he merely murmured come take courage she got up i will she said and wiping her eyes she began to walk again with the uncertain step of an elderly woman a little farther on the road passed beneath a clump of trees which hid a few houses and they could distinguish the vibrating and regular blows of a blacksmith's hammer on the anvil and presently they saw a wagon standing on the right side of the road in front of a low cottage and two men shoeing a horse under a shed monsieur d'apreval went up to them 
where is pierre benedict's farm he asked take the road to the left close to the inn and then go straight on it is the third house past Poret's. there is a small spruce fir close to the gate you cannot make a mistake they turned to the left she was walking very slowly now her legs threatened to give way and her heart was beating so violently that she felt as if she should suffocate while at every step she murmured as if in prayer oh heaven heaven m d'apreval who was also nervous and rather pale said to her somewhat gruffly if you cannot manage to control your feelings you will betray yourself at once do try and restrain yourself how can i she replied my child when i think that i am going to see my child they were going along one of those narrow country lanes between farmyards that are concealed beneath a double row of beech trees at either side of the ditches and suddenly they found themselves in front of a gate beside which there was a young spruce fir this is it he said she stopped suddenly and looked about her the courtyard which was planted with apple trees was large and extended as far as the small thatched dwelling-house on the opposite side were the stable the barn the cow-house and the poultry-house while the gig the wagon and the manure-cart were under a slated outhouse four calves were grazing under the shade of the trees and black hens were wandering all about the enclosure all was perfectly still the house-door was open but nobody was to be seen and so they went in when immediately a large black dog came out of a barrel that was standing under a pear-tree and began to bark furiously there were four beehives on boards against the wall of the house m d'apreval stood outside and called out is anybody at home then a child appeared a little girl of about ten dressed in a chemise and a linen petticoat with dirty bare legs and a timid and cunning look she remained standing in the doorway as if to prevent anyone going in what do you want she asked is your father in no where is he i don't know and your mother gone after the cows will she be back soon i don't know then suddenly the lady as if she feared that her companion might force her to return said quickly i shall not go without having seen him we will wait for him my dear friend as they turned away they saw a peasant woman coming toward the house carrying two tin pails which appeared to be heavy and which glistened brightly in the sunlight she limped with her right leg and in her brown knitted jacket that was faded by the sun and washed out by the rain she looked like a poor wretched dirty servant here is mamma the child said when she got close to the house she looked at the strangers angrily and suspiciously and then she went in as if she had not seen them she looked old and had a hard yellow wrinkled face one of those wooden faces that country people so often have m d'apreval called her back i beg your pardon madam but we came in to know whether you could sell us two glasses of milk she was grumbling when she reappeared in the door after putting down her pails i don't sell milk she replied we are very thirsty he said and madame is very tired can we not get something to drink the peasant woman gave them an uneasy and cunning glance and then she made up her mind as you are here i will give you some she said going into the house and almost immediately the child came out and brought two chairs which she placed under an apple tree and then the mother in turn brought out two bowls of foaming milk which she gave to the visitors she did not return to the house however but remained standing near them as if to watch them and to find out for what purpose they had come there you have come from fecamp she said yes m d'apreval replied we are staying at fecamp for the summer and then after a short silence he continued have you any fowls you could sell us every week 
the woman hesitated for a moment and then replied yes i think i have i suppose you want young ones yes of course what do you pay for them in the market d'apreval who had not the least idea turned to his companion what are you paying for poultry in fecamp my dear lady four francs and four francs fifty centimes she said her eyes full of tears while the farmer's wife who was looking at her askance asked in much surprise is the lady ill as she is crying he did not know what to say and replied with some hesitation no no but she lost her watch as we came along a very handsome watch and that troubles her if anybody should find it please let us know mother benedict did not reply as she thought it a very equivocal sort of answer but suddenly she exclaimed oh here is my husband she was the only one who had seen him as she was facing the gate d'apreval started and madame de cadour nearly fell as she turned round suddenly on her chair a man bent nearly double and out of breath stood there ten yards from them dragging a cow at the end of a rope without taking any notice of the visitors he said confound it what a brute and he went past them and disappeared in the cow-house her tears had dried quickly as she sat there startled without a word and with the one thought in her mind that this was her son and d'apreval whom the same thought had struck very unpleasantly said in an agitated voice is this monsieur benedict who told you his name the wife asked still rather suspiciously the blacksmith at the corner of the high road he replied and then they were all silent with their eyes fixed on the door of the cow-house which formed a sort of black hole in the wall of the building nothing could be seen inside but they heard a vague noise movements and footsteps and the sound of hoofs which were deadened by the straw on the floor and soon the man reappeared in the door wiping his forehead and came toward the house with long slow strides he passed the strangers without seeming to notice them and said to his wife go and draw me a jug of cider i'm very thirsty then he went back into the house while his wife went into the cellar and left the two parisians alone let us go let us go henri madame de cadour said nearly distracted with grief and so d'apreval took her by the arm helped her to rise and sustaining her with all his strength for he felt that she was nearly fainting he led her out after throwing five francs on one of the chairs as soon as they were outside the gate she began to sob and said shaking with grief oh oh is that what you have made of him he was very pale and replied coldly i did what i could his farm is worth eighty thousand francs and that is more than most of the sons of the middle classes have they returned slowly without speaking a word she was still crying the tears ran down her cheeks continually for a time but by degrees they stopped and they went back to fecamp where they found monsieur de cadour waiting dinner for them as soon as he saw them he began to laugh and exclaimed so my wife has had a sunstroke and i am very glad of it i really think she has lost her head for some time past neither of them replied and when the husband asked them rubbing his hands well i hope that at least you have had a pleasant walk monsieur d'apreval replied a delightful walk i assure you perfectly delightful end of abandoned by guy de maupassant